And so when you wake up in the morning, you can look at the Aura Ring app and it will tell you the quality of sleep that you have. Now, based on that, it will also give you prediction how your day is going to go. We're neurologically built to be entertained. You, you know, you put a little kid in front of a TV set at age two or three in there. Fascinated, right? Someone who has in the past or is currently experiencing long COVID. I couldn't focus on a page at all. So bit by bit, I forced myself to focus on a page. Read one page, read five pages, get back to reading. And so I began doing everything little by little. Let me see if I can stand and I can walk from here to that door and then crawl the rest of the way to the bathroom. Osvaldo C. Garcia, a pioneer neuronutritionist with 40 years of expertise and a best-selling author of five books. As a lifespan engineer and avid runner who has triumphed over long COVID, Osvaldo brings transformative insights from his latest work. After COVID, optimize your health in a changing world. Get ready for a conversation full of groundbreaking ideas and inspiration. And then based on that, you're going to work out better. You're going to, you're going to think better during the daytime. Your moods are going to be better. Everything goes better to the extent that the quality of your sleep is actually as it ought to be. Can we survive and have high quality life without the supplement? People, in my opinion, really don't get better. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. Over the last year, 86.6% .6 of our regular viewers have not yet hit the subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It's a small gesture on your end and a huge leap forward for our channel. If you wouldn't mind, we would love to ask you if you found our channel informative and engaging, if you can please hit that subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It allows us to go ahead and continue to put out great content, better guests, and as always, we will always put out two episodes per week. Thank you so much. Oz, welcome to the show. It is a pleasure having you. Gentlemen, thank you so much for having me. You know, I want to start the conversation with COVID. Now, when the CDC first started asking about long COVID, a staggering one in three adults reported having long COVID. Now, fortunately, that percentage seems like it's decreased over time. However, a recent study shows roughly 7% of all adults, which translates to roughly 17 million people, currently are experiencing long COVID as of March of 2024. And it's currently April of 2024. Now, studies are showing that the rates of long COVID remain steady and new treatments or preventions are needed. So this is a, it's, it's a very serious topic. And I think I speak for many of us, but we all know at this point, someone who has in the past or is currently experiencing long COVID. So I am looking forward to our conversation and I wanna start off with your story. I understand that you, know, you ended up at the hospital with a severe case of COVID. I'd like to see if we can first, if you'd be so kind to share your story and journey of how you ended up with COVID and the struggles that you went through. It's a slightly complicated journey. I'm a long distance runner. I've been a runner, a racer, a marathoner for well over 40 years. And that kind of was the prelude to uh, what happened next occurred. Um, I've incurred a lot of biological damage on my body as a result of being a long distance runner for so many years. Among them was a deterioration in the cervical bones in my, in, in my, my neck. So January of 2021, elective surgery was available for just that little month. The lockdown appeared to be over and the worst of COVID in New York was about to show up in uh, spring of 2021, starting pretty much towards the end of January 2021. But it peaked in, in March, as you may recall, April. And so by the time that I went in for sports surgery, the vaccine wasn't available. And it was very poorly understood in terms of somebody being tested and they could still test negative, 
yet be positive. In other, in other words, be mm -hmm. asymptomatic. And that's what occurred. The gentleman that I shared the recovery room with is a very well-known rugby player. He had flown in from England to get the same kind of surgery that I did. Now, you may or may not recall, but at that point, Delta Plus, which was the most insidious form of uh, COVID at that time, to be followed later by um, Omicron, he brought it over. And I was in the recovery room for two days with this gentleman um, pretty much spreading COVID. So he was my point man in that regard. I went home and over the course of a little bit less than two weeks, I started to get worse and worse and worse. The symptoms were severe exhaustion, a lot of pain in my neck, um, a lot of um, disorientation. And when I would call the surgery department at Mount Sinai, they were telling me that this is what recovery looks like. So I waited it out. And finally, I, as I best recall, on day 12, I called them and I asked them, could they please see me? I think there's something wrong with my surgery. I went in and um, they, they took one look at me. They immediately put me up on a gurney. They ran a PET scan on my right leg and I had several clots. They immediately took me to um, the emergency room. And I wound up, as a consequence, spending about a month in Mount Sinai. So wow. I went in for sports surgery and I came out a month later at 98 pounds on an oxygen compressor that I had to wear for about another two or three months. So at that point, the management of how somebody um, should have been treated, the way that testing was being done and so on, it just kind of, it kind of slipped through the cracks with me. Were I to do it over again, had I known what I know now, I probably would have put off elective surgery for a while. So mm. the impact on my body wound up being a book. It's called After COVID. It wound up being on Amazon's ta top 10 bestsellers. And it's a very dark story. There's nothing that I would say is redeeming about it at all. I think the life afterwards, what I did, how it is that I bought my body back from um, long haul COVID was a very personal journey. And I think it involves a lot of moving parts. We can talk about that. Thank you for mm -hmm. sharing that. It's good that you mentioned your book because my next question will be about um, some of the points that you uh, did in your book. So again, it's titled After COVID and everybody can find it on Amazon. And in the book, you're uh, going into details of step-by-steps step, like recovery after the COVID, what are the healthy uh, uh, habits overall. And you go into great details about the magic uh, ingredient for COVID recovery, which is uh, uh, sleep. Yeah. So I would like to ask you, what are the top tips for sleep optimization in your opinion? Well, let's just say that the, all elements came together, but, but getting a very high quality form of sleep became central to my recovery, right? So at the beginning, um, coming out of the hospital, you're pretty much dealing with a lot of trauma. You're dealing with a certain amount of PTSD. You're not sleeping well. And, I, 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 and you're also exhausted. So you could sleep 12 hours, 14 hours, and still be really tired. Um, mm. As I learned what I needed to do to actually get my health under control, to become who I was before I went to the hospital, I had to retrain my brain so that I could have sleep be a superpower. Not sleep because I was ill, but getting mm -hmm. to a point where my sleep became something that um, allowed the different nutrients that I was taking, the different ways that I was learning to be mindful and meditate, that all of that would come together in sleep. So now I'm a champion sleeper. And anybody who's interested in being well, whether you're a long haul COVID sufferer, whether you're a highly stressed out human being, the ability to have eight hours of quality sleep 
is central to how well anybody's can do. But as we now know, sleep is a highly active period of our lives. There's a lot of repair that goes on, memory consolidation, organs that repair, the immune system reboots itself. There's a system within the brain called the glyphatic system, which is similar to the lymphatic system. And it's where the brain can actually clear out metabolic waste, certainly from the fuel that it burns, mm -hmm. the sugar that it burns during the day, and that only occurs when you're sleeping. So, so getting to the point where you're having repairing sleep, reparative sleep, became extremely critical to my recovery, and it still is now. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. And what's the difference between the normal sleep and the superpower sleep? Well, you, you know, you're, you're laying in bed looking at your cell phone. It's 11 o'clock at night. You've got your iPad on. You have your TV set on, right? Um, um, there's noise from the street. Your room is really warm. And and you're going to take a sleeping pill, right? Mm -hmm. so, so this is a very typical, stereotypical way that people go to sleep. It's 11 o'clock mm. at night and you should be asleep. And, and to be looking at your cell phone on a certain screen, but we know that there's an option on it that'll flip the light to nighttime lighting. Most people don't do that. So the consequence is they're looking at a cell phone when they should it, and they're looking at the lighting, which is altering the light that goes to the brain. And instead of triggering melatonin in your brain so that you can fall asleep, you're triggering different ways that, that will wake the phone, no, wake the brain up. So, mm -hmm. so one of our observations is you should turn your phone off a couple of hours or four. You have a setting in focus that says when the phone should stop ringing, and you shouldn't be answering your phone after 8 a.m., after 8 p.m., unless, unless it's really important, right? Mm -hmm. But other than that, you should be turning it off bit by bit winding down and you should have different kind of lighting in your room and your room should be cool. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, 68 degrees is what we found seems to be critical so that you're, you go to sleep and you may want to listen to meditation tapes, binaural tapes. Some people like to read. Some people like to listen to a book on Audible on their headset and fall asleep to that, right? There's a way that you can measure sleep or rather that you can measure the quality of your sleep. So there are different tools. There's one called an Aura Ring. You can get that online. I think it's available on Amazon. Um, and it's a piece of artificial intelligence that will tell you how long you slept, how many times during the night you moved, how much oxygen is in your system, your heart rate, your heart rate variability. Then it'll tell you how long you were in REM sleep, in deep sleep, and light sleep. So it's a lot of data. And so when you wake up in the morning, you can look at the Aura Ring app and it will tell you the quality of sleep that you have. Now, based on that, it will also give you prediction how your day is going to go. So it's auto-correcting. Mm -hmm. After a week, two or three of using that, you know that when you're looking at your cell phone late at night, your, your next day is probably going to be pretty lousy, right? Or if you turned everything off by 9, 30, 10, listen to a story or a podcast or an audible book and or meditation tape and you're asleep within half an hour your, your next day turns out to be infinitely better right hmm. so, so you can use a whoop um there are other devices that people use to measure what's going on in their sleep i think um there are different features on the iphone that allow you to do that but but getting a sense of the quality of your sleep keeps you honest. And then based on that, you're going to work out better. You're going to, you're going to think better during the daytime. Your moods are going to be better. Everything goes better to the extent that the quality of your sleep is actually as it ought to be. 
So central to everything, right in the middle, the hub, is sleep. From there comes diet. From there comes being in nature. From there comes how you treat people. From there comes journaling. From there comes exercise. From there comes anything that you determine is going to have a measurable impact on your day. I wonder how many people actually do not Mind use their phones or do not watch television. I mean, it's 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 funny because you know, I think and I think in life when you take a look at a lot of the problems, the solutions oftentimes are quite simple, yet it's so hard to implement, especially today as a society. I mean, everyone you talk to, the, the last thing they do, most people do before they sleep is probably <laughs> turning off their phone. It's hard. It's hard. It's very hard, even though even though we, we know all the information right. and we're still not doing it. I was right. doing it for two months in a row, no phones in the bedroom. And then all of a sudden, okay, I, I, I will cheat for a second. And that's it. From, from now on, I'm, I'm with my phone in my bed. Well, yeah, well it, says, it says a lot about the um, mechanisms of, of how a phone works, right? The, the, the uh, pull that it has on our brain. We're, we're neurologically built to be entertained. You, you know, you mm. pull a little kid in front of a TV set at age two or three in there, fascinated right yeah and and then give give that same kid a little portable version with a screen and before you know it they figured out how to do everything by age four or five most kids in america know how to operate an iphone better than their parents yep right so there's yeah. there's this I I extreme connection where children that are being born today are born into a world where they they don't know what it's not what it's not like to have a portable uh, uh, device of, of that manner, right? Their exposure to digital data is continual. Computers, iPads, television sets, iPhones, whatever else. And, and, and so that begins to alter, certainly in, in adults, the, the quality of their sleeping experience. And, it, and, and even it, it, w many instances, when we're working, when we're starting to work with clients, we begin to wean them off little by little. Can you give me two nights a week where you leave your phone in the kitchen? Yeah. You know, and, it's, and it's a struggle. <laughs> Can you give me That's three funny. nights? Oh, okay, we'll start with one. <laughs> start with one. Did you find any particular hours uh, that good for sleep? I mean, the best time to go to sleep and best time to wake up? Uh, between 9.30 and 10.30 is latest. And then you should mm -hmm. be up somewhere between six and seven. That is my bedtime routine right now, but that's only because I have a six month old daughter. So I'm forced to sleep extra early because my quality of sleep is very questionable <laughs> at all times of the hours. Now, Oz, I know I want to talk a little bit about, and we were talking about fatigue, uh, but I want to talk about the post exertional malaise that a lot of people experience. Now, I know you lost. 30 pounds or maybe even over 30 pounds in 16 days. I, I, I read that from your book, which is extremely scary. What advice do you have for people uh, slowly building back their physical strength and endurance? What did that look like for you or, or a general uh, guideline that somebody can follow if they're on a s similar uh, path here? Well, um, I mean, my, my case is extreme. Um, right. Although when you're talking long haulers, they all think their, their case is extreme. Um, and, and there are people that had less symptomology than me that never really got back all the way. You know, they're still in a bed Correct. years later suffering with exhaustion, uh, multiple uh, prescription meds. I, I, don't, I really don't think that, that long haul is a medical problem. I see it as being a biological problem. And to the extent doctors go at it with only a medical approach. Let's find out which, which prescription drugs are going to work. Um, people, in my opinion, really don't get better. There's, and I'm not saying that the only approach is functional medicine or biohacking or um, um, working in any modality that, that I would say is non-medical, you know, Ayurvedic, acupuncture, body, that kind of stuff. I think it's complementary. I think you have to have the best of both worlds. 
But if you only rely on, on medical approaches, then I don't think it's going to get really far. Uh, 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 please re re uh, repeat the question again. Uh, what advice do you have for slowly building back physical strength and endurance? Okay, good. So I wanted to say that because then, then you know that you, uh, you're going to have to add everything in slowly, somewhat slowly, right? And there is a, a great author, his name is James Clear. He wrote a book entitled Atomic Habits, which is probably the best book that there is on learning how to get to do something a little bit at a time. So in Atomic Habits, James Clear talks about um, an event that happened to him in high school. He was interested in playing baseball, went up to bat, and the guy in front of him lost control over his bat. Bat went right into James's head and uh, crushed his skull. Now, he wound up being hospitalized, and he worked very diligently to recover his health. All he knew was while he was recovering that he wanted to go back and play ball. So every day he did a little something to actually build up the practices so that he could go back to playing ball someday, which he did. He wound up being uh, voted most valuable player, I think, uh, out, of out of his university. So I took that to heart. I went from being a full-blown athlete the week before I went in for sports surgery, where I could get down the floor and do 150 push-ups, do my TRX, go hit um, Central Park, do a run, whatever. And when I got out of the hospital, I could barely, barely up, up walk. I mean, yeah. I, I pretty much it, it was crawling everywhere, right? And I took umbrage from uh, James Clear's uh, points of view and so I began doing everything little by little. Let me see if I can stand and I can walk from here to that door and then crawl the rest of the way to the bathroom. And then the next thing, let me see if I can crawl to that door and go one more foot and then crawl the way, until I could do the whole thing, until I could go to the kitchen on my own power without using a walker, until I got off the oxygen compressor. So everything was a little bit at a time. And I think for long haulers, um, mindset is critical. Like, like um, um, how it is that I used to think when I was a runner, that the funny thing that, that was in my mind, gentlemen, was if I, if I want to go back to running a marathon, what do I need to do? And unless you've got that kind of optimism and hope, you're going to sit there and, and wallow in self-pity, why me, right. how could this happen to me? And I, I, I just wouldn't allow that to happen at all. There were a few moments where I had some self-pity, but for the most part, it was, let me get into new routines every day. I couldn't read. Mm -hmm. um, I, ha I couldn't focus on a page at all. So bit by bit, I forced myself to focus on a page. Read one page, read five pages, get back to reading. Same thing with walking, same thing with breathing. Since my lungs were demolished in the hospital um, and my lung capacity at one point had fallen to 74% oxygen capacity, we're all right wow. now at about 98, more or less, yeah. uh, um, full oxygenation. So imagine, imagine if you're at 74%, what if I slashed off about 20 points, one to 20 points of your breathing. You'd, you, you wouldn't be able to stand up. So so I had to teach myself how to breathe. Well, mm. at a time, one exercise, using um, different breathing devices that built up my lung capacity, my oxygen capacity, till now I'm back to normal. So, so mm. a little bit every day, a la James Clear, one little atomic habit is what got me back to normal. Yeah, that's a great answer. That's a great answer and great connection with Atomic Habits. I think, and again, uh, you know, for people uh, listening to this on the surface level, you're like, oh, yeah, that's easy. But so many of us mm -hmm. fail to actually practice that. Whatever the, whatever the situation is, whatever the problem is, we want to accomplish it right away. We're taking, we're trying to take 20 steps 
when in and and fail after getting to three when in reality we should be taking step one or step 0.5 and that's really with everything in life uh, if you want to achieve something you know whether it's uh whether if you want to add on muscle or lose weight right losing weight I mean, instead of trying to go on the most extreme diet and go turn into green juice smoothies and starving yourself, why don't you just, you know, take two less bites of your what you're used to for that burger and then next week take another less two bites? And it's just building up those micro habits and it's like and it compounds all of those little things compounds and it's three months later and you're like, oh, crap, <laughs> there's so many different things about me right now. Right. Um, and so, again, very valuable advice, uh, but so many of us don't practice it. And mostly this advice is mostly this is advice is for men because men are always overachievers. They want to do mm. ten steps, ten steps, and they uh, tend to more achieve than it's supposed. To, and then they never do it, and then they give up. <laughs> yeah, and and and, and uh, we're we're part of a culture <clears throat> which is uh, driven by immediacy. So so by that. Um, I mean that we want what we want, we want it now. And, and patience um, is, is a virtue in short supply. Not too many people know that you need to commodify virtue, you know, but, but, um, that patience, excuse me. So, so when, when I learned that I had to be, I didn't have a choice because my body right. just wouldn't do what it needed to do. Once you, you learn the way that I had to, that I had to slow everything down, that everything would come eventually. And, and believe it, then here we are, you know, three and a half, three, three years, three and a quarter years later, everything turned out the way that it showed up. But, but it was a lot of hard work, a little bit at a time, and so what? Yeah. And, and it's been uh, almost two years, right, since you published your uh, book after COVID, The book correct? I published the year, the early, excuse me, middle of 2022, early in 2022, right. so, correct. Yeah, so two years. So within these two years, have you seen any new promising treatments or supplements that you didn't mention in your book? Yeah, at some point I hope to expand the back of the book um, with other approaches. They're, they're not all that conventional and they shouldn't be. I think many of the conventional approaches don't work. They didn't work for me. They haven't worked for many people that I know um, that were long haulers. And and I have my own approach based on what I see makes a difference. Um, but I, I would say also, um, one of the things that I didn't elaborate in the book was, was mindfulness meditation. So I think being mm. a meditator and actually taking the coursework to do a good, a good, learning experience on, on how to um, quiet your mind, on how to deal with anxiety, those pay off remarkably well. Mm -hmm. And could you please tell me how often do you meditate? What kind of meditation do you do? To, uh, every day I do some form of, of um, quiet mindfulness meditation, at least 10 to 20 minutes per day. And there are different systems that I like. I like Sam Harris. He's um, one of our, our greatest neuroscientists out of Stanford. He has an app called Waking Up. Waking Up is wonderful because it's got so many different kinds of meditations that work from five minutes to an hour. And I think that they're exceptional. I think, I think the whole app is exceptional. Um, I study with Joe Dispenza. Joe Dispenza is probably one of the world's greatest full-on um, physical kind of meditations that you can do. And I've done retreats with him. I'll probably do another one in July. But they remind you how to be in the present, how to slow mm. the brain down, how to actually learn how to breathe. And I, I think that between those two, you, you, you have great choices. A lot of Joe's uh, meditations are on YouTube. Waking up, you can get at the Apple Store. There are many others that people like. I think some people like Calm, Headspace. So, mm. so long as you're doing anything, you're you're going to be much better off, even if it's five minutes a day. 
Have you been meditating before or you started after you got the surgery in COVID? I've done courses over the years on meditation and just like any crazy New Yorker, you know, you're, <laughs> you're, you're, you're thinking, oh, I can do it tomorrow. You know, before you know it, a year goes by, haven't done anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but after doing Joe Dispenza last July, I wound up um, meditating pretty much every day. I want to speak about the relationship between the medical professionals and the people, because the more I speak about COVID with people, I see a lot of them face big disbelief or lack of support uh, from medical professionals. So what advice do you have? So what advice do you have for advocating for yourself and finding knowledgeable care? Um, I, I think reading my book is really important and I don't need more book sales. But, I, but what I do want is to serve people that found themselves in my situation. So, like I said, the second part of the book is a workbook, and you can start going through it and begin to understand that there are options that you can learn on your own. Who is it that may be doing work in, in, in the functional medical area, the um, lifespan area, that I think has relevance for long world COVID, I think that if you work with most doctors, they're going to look at you as a medical problem. Like I said, many people that I've worked with have wound up on one, two, three, four um, antidepressants, anti-anxiety medication, products that deal with, with any multitude of concerns, high blood pressure, heart disease, and so on, with, without taking a look at diet, exercise, um, meditation, uh, um, cold plunges, saunas, the, the different supplements of which there are so many that have a measurable impact on the body, probiotics, the microbiome. So when you start stacking everything together, there is likely a path to dealing with long-haul COVID or post-COVID symptomology that your doctor just doesn't understand. We so many people going, we've seen many people go through the Mount Sinai long haul program, and I find them to be unbelievably ill-equipped. <clears throat> the recommendations mm. are, again, just strictly pharmaceutical. I'm not saying that right. for some people the pharmaceuticals are not useful, but it's, it's in my, my perspective, long haul COVID is a multifaceted problem with multifaceted solutions. Hmm. I want to talk, since we're talking about the supplements, I kind of want to bring it to the average person. So I, so for the average person that's not in the wellness space, it can be very overwhelming. So for example, but uh, if Vlad is into the wellness space and he takes a, a, a cocktail of, of pills, but for me, you know, and in your book, you go on to talk about things like alpha GP, uh, GPC for cognitive function, adaptogens like ashwagandha, probiotics, prebiotics, postbiotics, the list goes on and on and on. So my question to you for the average person is, how does one start who is interested in using supplements uh, specifically for healthy aging? Because I know you did, you spent decades uh, uh, in, in this area. So the average person in listening right now, uh, what tips can you can you give here is it is it a is it a here's a list of 100 uh, supplements that you need to take or hey you're starting off these are the top three or top four maybe even top five things that you need to everybody should immediately immediately look into sure um supplements come in different categories so you've got vitamins and minerals you've got plant-based products you have essential fatty acids like fish oil. You have nootropics, which are nutrients that are strictly for making the brain work better. You've got peptides, which are all new category of nutrients that have the ability to mimic much of what the body does. So, so we've moved from, you know, like minerals and vitamins now to all these remarkable new categories like nootropics and peptides. And, mm -hmm. and what I do is, is depending on the person that I'm working with or what you may be interested in is to go through the book and see what your problems are and then do mm -hmm. a Google search, right? Or go to chat GTP even better or go to perplexity.ai 
and then you know type in ashwagandha. Let me see what that does. Oh, okay. It'll allow me to reduce my anxiety. I can sleep better if I take it. So, so, so maybe what I'll do is I'll start using that. Is there somebody that understands how these products work so that I can begin to incorporate them instead of using a sleeping pill, which is not, in my point of view, going to solve your sleeping problem. Maybe it can knock you out, but it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't serve the interest of what we were talking about earlier, normalizing right. deep sleep, REM sleep, all the things that happen during sleep. So it, it really means that you have to become, in a way, a, a citizen doctor. You need to figure out on your own, if, if you're a long hauler you know, or a post-COVID sufferer, a, a, a lot of this stuff really on your own. You need to educate mm. yourself and, and use doctors where they may play a role and jump, you know, kind of bounce some things off a really good practitioner. But more often than not, you're going to find that if you're a long, if you've got 17 million long haulers, what do you think Benson right. is at about it, right? At right. this point. And, and they keep coming up with answers in terms of what it is. But, but most of the literature that I follow is we should be coming close to solving long haul COVID as though it's reducible. Like we're going to come up with one right. pill that's going to solve right. this, this multifaceted, highly complex problem. And do you think nowadays, can we survive and have high quality life without the supplements? I don't think so. You know, like, like, look, you and I could get to California by walking, right? But we may as well take a, 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 a Boeing 747. Oops. Maybe a better one, and it won't <laughs> be in California in five hours. So, so it, we want to take we want to take advantage of technology, but right. we're taking advantage of technology right now. There's nothing wrong with it. It's the same thing with supplementation. I want to enhance my living experience. We already know that there are nutrients like alpha GPC or acetyl carnitine or alpina. Um, um, Corona, where you can actually make the brain work better. There are just so many products that amplify your 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 physical performance, your mental your mental performance, and it actually leaves you in a better space. Coffee may give you a boost. Caffeine is terrific; people love it. But when you use alpha GPC, you're getting mental efficiency but you're also getting a better brain in the process. You're getting better neurons, right? So, so we could do that with many supplements. There are supplements that build better muscle and right. you're remarkably safe. So, so we could be putting together, and, and especially after our loss, almost 40 pounds in the hospital, certain supplements and nutrients that built my muscle back, mass back and my power. So, so we use them as tools. You don't have to. But if you're dealing with long haul COVID, you're never going to think out of that hole by just eating, right. you know, vegetables. Right. No, definitely. I have a follow up question to our discussion, which is something that's interesting, and I'm glad to I get to ask it now. Which is, my question is when it comes to dosage. And right now, I'm not talking about long haul COVID. I like to always try to break it down for like the average individual. So again, let's take me as an example. I'll be the average uh, idiot here, if you will. Uh, the, the issue that I've had, and we've talked to you know many health experts, and they've recommended some incredible products. And I'll go online then. Here's the issue that I encou encounter, which many people may, might also, but maybe they don't pay attention. And that issue comes to dosage. When you go in, you see one company advertising 50 milligrams, the next company advertising 100, the next company advertising extra potent 2,000 milligrams. When I take a look at that, because I, I'm very careful, then I start fear starts coming in and saying, man, well, I'm not exactly sure. I know on the label it says, okay, you know, not to exceed X amount of dosage, but what is the appropriate dosage for all of these you know, supplements in these different categories? So how does the average person like me start to think about that? Because dosage is a concern for me. And that's one of the reasons why I've actually stayed away uh, uh, from taking some of these, unless, of course, I would go and advise with a consultant such as yourself. But the average person doesn't 
may not have the funds to do so. So again, my question relates to the average person. And if they're worried like me, what, what can they do? Um, it, 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 it depends on what your, what your end goal is. What is it that you want by taking a supplement, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm real big on, on doing, doing research. So, so remember that I mentioned like either go to chat GPT or go mm -hmm. to perplexity. And then you can, you can actually type in what's, what, are, what are the best dosages for, let's say, alpha GPC? Mm. What are the recommended dosages? And then it's going to aggregate everything that, that's on the internet and say, studies seem to indicate that for individuals in this age range, this is what we know seems to work best. If it's gender specific, we know that for women, it could be more sensitive as so you start lower. So I think searching, if you're going to do it on your own, is is going to make all the difference in the world in that regard and and or you work with a professional but i think in just the ways that i started 40 years ago um i would go to the library and i i would literally sit in there for hours and try to figure out differences in terms of amounts and what works best so it didn't always work out well but but <laughs> you learn right and here we are you, 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 it, there's so much online data that, right. that especially today if you're if you're interested in you know if you're afraid of dementia or alzheimer's you can just go online and just start ty typing what are the best supplements for a ma you know ma male x amount of age mm -hmm. um if i wanted to reduce uh, alzheimer's uh, how much superzine a should i be using for instance and mm -hmm. and right there you've got a good idea i believe in starting low I believe in starting even below recommended dosages for most people. And I believe in starting with a very light amount of supplements, right? I probably take about 150 a day, but that's me. Wow. So, there, so I break it up, 50 in the morning, 50 in the afternoon, 50 in the evening. And I'm targeting certain things, right? All the stuff that I had to target to get out of long haul. And then if I want to live another 73 years, what do I need to be doing now? So, so I'm stacking based on very well-defined end results. And mm. I also have a peer community that I can go back and speak to. But I, I wouldn't recommend my lifestyle to most people. Right. Can, for fun, can I ask you how much it costs you to maintain that 150 pills a day for a month? What does that monthly cost come out to be roughly? Well, well I, I have my dispensary. It's it's in the desk. Okay, got it. Well, how long does it take you to actually uh, eat like fifty pills in a session? Like, are you just take? Is, is it easy? I mean, I don't fifty p fifty pills sounds very. Uh... You, you get good at taking ten down at a time. Okay, all right, ten down at a time. Well, I'm scared to take down <laughs> one at a time. So okay, there we go. So that's a, that's a good metric. Ten pills at a time. Okay. I see. I'm far away from it. I I'm taking I think fifteen a day or something. Fifteen. Like that, so. Yeah, I'm taking one right now. Oh, maybe two vitamin D and then Omega. But but the one I but in the 15, up. there are like another hundred insights. So it's like combination of everything. Inside. Well, well, I'm, I'm also looking. Remember that I've got other things on my mind. And, 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 and so I'm breaking it down categorically in terms of my goals. Right. So I want right. to hit four or five things in the morning, four or five in the afternoon and four or five in the evening. Mm -hmm. And how long did you do this? Um, I've, I've been building up my protocols over 25 years. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's speak about the, uh, probiotics because many of us generally aware of the probiotics and the benefits of taking for the gut health, of course, but probiotic alone don't pay the perfect picture when it comes to creating a healthy bowel environment. That's so could you please dig into the specifics of prebiotics, probiotics, postbiotics, why we need them, and what are some recommendations uh, the companies that you, they, you they, give? They, you're correct. There are three. They're prebiotics. Um, prebiotics make the bowel stickier. So probiotics mm -hmm. can then go in and adhere to the water of the bowel better. So my favorite probiotic is Jerusalem artichoke um, extract. looks almost like sugar. And so typically, mm -hmm. if I have a cup of co coffee or tea in the morning, I put in about a quarter teaspoon. Mm. Also, my coffee is designed to be really good for, for my health. 
So um, a teaspoon of cacao, a teaspoon of collagen powder, um, um, and an extract of, of citrus called pectisol. So already I have a supplement in my coffee. I, I've got five things in there that are good for me. Then um, I'm setting up all the morning supplements, including my uh, oh my prebiotic, right? My quarter teaspoon of of um, Jerusalem artichoke, and then with that I'll take two or three different probiotics. I, I rotate through different companies, and and I'm also reintroducing new bacteria. So I I, I think mm. Seed is a great company. They make great products. Um, and for a lot of people, and I, I have nothing invested in them, but they're, they they work very well for me, many people. So I recommend seeding. You take two capsules of that. How do you pronounce that? How do you, I'm sorry, how do you spell that company name? Sure, Seed. S-E-E-D. S-E. Okay, okay. Just, okay. They make great products. Um, then a postbiotic pretty much feeds the probiotics better. So there's um, a group of postbiotics that are called butyrate, butyric acid, right? And and we recommend one called tributyrate, tributyrate. So tributyrate typically is about two capsules. And and so I've got my prebiotic, I've got my my uh, probiotics. And then afterwards, as I'm getting ready and I'm preparing my breakfast or my smoothie, I'm then taking two or three capsules of tributyrate, tributyrate. And, and that's one of the best, if you're not, if you're going to take any supplements at all, it's everything to um, empower your microbiome. That's really important. Have you heard of the company Viome? Um, I love Viome. So I'm using the Viome and they basically send all the supplements, yes, in this eight pills and they have separate prebiotics and probiotics all in one. It's, uh, is it? fine to take it together absolutely or you have to take probiotics separately. yeah i'm i'm, I'm i t I, I like i like to take mine separately but that works really well for a lot of people mm -hmm. convenience and and i would say convenience in so far as that you're going to get it done right and if it's all in one cap so you do it so oz we have uh, just two questions for you uh, uh left and thank you again for a, a wonderful conversation thank you my, my my next question and i'll then i'll pass it to vlad but my last question to you is something that is great importance to me we've seen headlines come out in the past few years about the decline of relationships and sex sexually active americans are at a 30-year low americans are increasingly single and okay with it the current trend is to date yourself first prioritize your mental health, and feel empowered. This also extends to social connections. We've increasingly consumed ourselves in the digital world and, generally speaking, have failed to maintain healthy, real-life social connections. And I think we both agree here that maintaining social connection and intimacy is so important for mental health and longevity. But we seem to be going in the opposite direction as a society as a whole. What are your thoughts on this? Is this a scary trend? Uh, you know, what can we do? There, there are a number of ways to answer it. Um, if if you bought the Hollywood line, the way that I did growing up, it, it you you always had to be in, in a relationship, right? And and you always thought there was going to be a happy ending. So what happens often is people get involved and then if it breaks up they're looking for somebody else the what's that new phrase find your twin flame and 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 so they're often going in and out of relationships without ever really getting sense of what their lives are alone right that I, the the oversaturation in terms of social media what it is that you need to accumulate you ought to have um the fact that you should be in a relationship. I think that if you, as, as, as you mature, and that's different than, than, than being older, oftentimes you find people that, and I found myself in that situation after COVID, where being alone and, and enjoying your own company becomes, I, I, I'd say, an, an almost divine space to be into, where... Mm. It, listen, being alone has its own problems. 
being involved has its own problems, right? So, so it's almost like big, big, big problems. But, but being alone often, and I went through this after um, I had COVID. I think the first two years, um, you know, COVID just completely turned me off to wanting to be with anybody anyway. Right. And then that evolved as I got better into let me explore my life and who I am alone. So if I was in social situations, I, I just didn't have an agenda. It wasn't like, hey, I want to meet somebody or I got that's a really cute chick. Let me get over there and see if I can exchange my you know, it took me a long time. And even now I find that being being involved or dating is an exercise in getting to know somebody. I think there's I, I don't have a private agenda back here. Like I gotta get I gotta, you know, like I was gonna say I gotta get a third pants. So so that's the, the, the main agenda that many urbanized people have, but you know, her pants or his pants, whatever. But 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 if you if you're able to not have that particular agenda, if you're comfortable with yourself, um, I think that's a really big step up. A, a dear friend of mine, Darina Hertz, wrote a book entitled The Lonely Planet. And there's a di big difference between finding solace with yourself and your company as opposed to being lonely. Right? And 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 I think at this point in my life, and it may be true for a lot of these people or not, um, enjoying your own company is a very high space to operate in. And then you you make your choices in terms of the people that you spend with, your friends, your acquaintances, the people that you are at work, so that it, it is an empowering environment. People that are compelled to try and get into another relationship, to another relationship, there's, there's that hedonic treadmill from the culture where you got to make it through school, you got to make it through college, you got to get the right job, you got to begin to accumulate a certain amount of wealth, you got to get the right partner or partners or, or, or whatever it is that's moving you along, along and you're not really spending time to understand what, what you're about. And, mm -hmm. and if there are people that actually are opting to spend more times in their own company, I actually would say that that's quite wonderful. On my side, I have two last questions. Uh, I know that decades ago you were doing extended fasts of seven to 10 days or even more. So my question is, is it really worth it? Yeah, um, um, this would make another great conversation. I love talking to you guys. The um, doing it to minimum fasting, let's start with that, like when you skip dinner twice a week, I think it's terrific, right? Have your last meal at three or four, skip dinner. Um, or have breakfast, skip lunch, and eat dinner, right? And breakfast maybe, maybe uh, bone broth, piece of soup, a green juice, something like that. But underfeeding often is terrific. There's a tremendous amount of science on how you benefit from skipping dinner, skipping meals. for Skipping a dinner and going to bed is great. How you feel when you wake up the next day? Unparalleled, right? And and it does a lot to repair your body. When you extend that, depending if you if you have the the patience, you can now go to any number of places in the city and buy enough juices to do 24, 48, 72 hours of juicing. And and I think it's a great beginning for a lot of people. Gives your kidneys a break, your your lungs a break your liver a break, your uh, pancreas a break, everything that, you know, your bowel gets a break. The human body was designed to not eat all the time. All predators, um, whether it's big canines um, um, or, or cats, they're, they're hungry a lot of the time. They're not eating all the time, right? So, so a lioness may not eat for two or three or four days until she kills a water beast. And then she's lucky if there aren't other 20 other animals looking at the same thing. So human beings are designed to go through periods where you're hunting an antelope and, and you're on the way eating um, insects that you pick up, low-hanging fruit, um, nuts that you're picking up along the way. 
and you get to the point where finally you kill something and eat it. But during that period of time, your body is repairing itself. And, and that kind of underfeeding and overfeeding, you, you can mimic by doing a fast. Okay, I have one last question, and this is a new tradition on our show to ask our guests. What question would you like our next guest to answer? What's the value they find of gratitude? Great question. What's the value they find of gratitude? Well, Oz, it has been an absolute pleasure getting to speak with you. Can you please let us, our audience know what you have going on, where they can find you, and any other information you'd like to share? Um, go to my website, ozgarcia.com. That's also going to have, uh, have upcoming events where I'll be talking. There's um, links there to Amazon for my books. Anybody that's interested in the the my story of having had COVID and my recovery, um, they can order after COVID there or go to Amazon. Social media is Oz Wellness, uh, Oz Wellness on Instagram. I don't think I'm I don't think I'm, I'm on Facebook that much these days. Oz, it's been an absolute pleasure. We've learned a lot. I've had a great time learning more about some of the very important supplements. I've actually added to my card the Jerusalem for the prebiotics and the tributarate for the postbiotics. Wonderful. And I agree with you that it is a very, very important place to start. You are 149 supplements. And short. Oz, one last question. How old are you? I just turned 73. You look fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Thank it's you, boys. See you later.